All right, welcome back to the Copywriters Podcast with your host, the world's greatest copywriting coach, David Garfinkel. David, how are you doing today? I'm fantastic, Nathan. How are you? I'm fantastic as well. I'm super excited about today's episode for the viewers on YouTube. They already know why I'm excited, but for the listeners, I'm going to let you uh, I'm going to let you let the cat out of the bag about why this episode is going to be so amazing. Yes. Well, our guest today has a unique vantage point in copywriting. As an executive at Boardroom for 34 years, Brian Kurtz worked with many of the most successful and famous copywriters of our time, including Gene Schwartz, Gary Bensavenga, and many others. As the guy in charge, Brian was responsible for selling over one billion, that's a billion with a B, dollars worth of products, $39 at a time to millions and millions of people. Seven years ago, Brian started a second career writing books and running mastermind groups, as well as republishing old direct marketing classics. I've wanted to have Brian on the show for a long time, and I was thrilled when he agreed to talk about copywriting legends that he worked with. If you've ever wondered what people at the top of the game were and are like, today's your lucky day. Brian's here to tell you. But I can't even begin to tell you how lucky you are that copy is powerful. You're responsible for how you use what you hear on this podcast. And most of the time, common sense is all you need. But if you make extreme claims and or if you're writing copy for offers in highly regulated industries like health, finance and business opportunity, you may want to get a legal review after you write and before you start using your copy. My larger clients do this all the time. First of all, Brian, welcome. I should I say that you're at an undisclosed location, or I mean, you're you're no, not it's where okay. You, we I'm, normally see I'm, I'm at the local library, so it's my my house has is being worked on. The floors are being done. I, I'm kicked out of my house, but I couldn't pass up the opportunity to be with you, David. So I made arrangements for a private room at the local library. Um, and also there, there's one thing in my bio that you said, which I just thought about. You said, you know, I sold a billion dollars worth of product, $39 at a time. And I'm yeah. sort of sound like I'm proud of that. And I am to some degree. I'm also not so proud about it because when I went on a, um, uh, a webinar teaching uh, call, with the copywriters at Agora Stansberry. Um, I was with all of them and they asked me like, what was the biggest regret of my career at Boardroom? And I said, you know, it's that I sold a billion dollars worth of product, $39 at a time. And what I meant by that is that we never had ascending prices and ascending offers. And it's interesting because, you know, in my second career with Titans Marketing, with Masterminds and and books and swipe files and all of that. It's all about ascension. It's all about, and actually it's descension. I, I started with sure. a $20,000 mastermind and worked my way down to a $125 book. And so yeah. it's up and down, up and down. Whereas at Boardroom, it was $39 at a time, but we cross sold up the wazoo. with Right. Ascension. Yeah. I think of Boardroom like Time Life or um, you know, book of the month. I mean, that's that's a consumer thing, but B2B is different. You can ascend. But let's talk about copywriters. You've worked with so many great copywriters as the guy who hired them. That's what sets you apart from everyone else we've we've had here, even that I know. I mean, there's Bill Jamie and, you know, others um, who are no longer with us and living legends, including Gary Ben Savenga, David Deutsch, Paris Lampropolis, not to mention Gene Schwartz, who I'd like to focus most of this call on, but um, could you tell us one or two things that if you think about the greats and you think about the specific things they do differently from other copywriters, what would they be? I, I actually, I can do them quickly because I, I, I wrote about it because it was, it always astounded me. Like these guys, the, the A-listers and the greats of all time, um, Actually, I identified seven things that every one of them, they all had in common and they all on a scale of one to 10 were nines and tens. And I'll, I'll quickly rattle them off. And then if you want to go in deeper into any one of them, but the, 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 the seven things are hunger, 
uh, insatiable curiosity, fe having feedback loops and never being the smartest person in the room, um, passion, knowledge of direct marketing principles and marketing, you know, real marketing knowledge. Um, uh, that's five. Um, humility is six. And then having a body of work over time, which is usually the first thing. Like when you go, a new writer yeah, comes in and no, you say- Brian, oh. that, that's great. But can you give us a specific example? Because I those are like ideals. And I- All right, I, so I, I can, I can, I can go into it. Like sure. one, one example, yeah. So hunger would be, you know, you don't you don't become a great copywriter. No, I mean a person. Know. Tell me about a person. Was was David Deutsch hungry? Was saying, give me some more dim sum? Was was um, Gary Bensavanga saying, hey, I, I, I need some snap, crackle, and pop? I mean, who was a person who actually exhibited one of these characteristics? Well, the people that exhibited were uh, Gary Bensavanga, Jim Rutz, Gene Schwartz, Mel Morton, Paris Lampropolis, David Deutsch, Arthur Johnson, um, Eric Betwell, Clayton Makepeace, Jim Punkry. But Can you remember just... a specific incident that demonstrated any of these qualities? Yeah, so with with um, understanding direct marketing knowledge as a copywriter, you know, I always say that you know a copywriter, if a copywriter who wants to just write for food, is not really that valuable. A copywriter who becomes a trusted advisor of their clients, like they were with me at Boardroom, becomes so much more valuable. So, for example, when I hired Jim Rutz or Gary Bensavanga or David Deutsch or Paris Lampropoulos. Like the first thing they asked me was, you know, things like not the obvious that they had the obvious things, you know, what packages have worked, what packages haven't show me the winners and losers. But they asked me for list histories, like what are the lists that were mailed for that particular product that they're working on and look at the selections on the list even. And, you know, I'm a list guy. I came out of the list business. So to me, that's the most valuable thing that a copywriter can know because it's the audience. And if you're going to write the best package to an audience that doesn't want it, you're going to get zero orders. You can write mediocre copy to an audience that's very targeted and make some money. If you write great copy to a perfect list, that, that's direct marketing nirvana. So the idea of just asking me for a list history, to ask me for segmentation of the names that we were mailing, that alone told me that they were a step above writers who just write for food. Yeah, that leads into uh, something you told me earlier, which was that Gene Schwartz was actually more interested in lists than he was in copy. I mean, we know that Gene Schwartz was interested in copy just from the two books you republished and two talks I've seen on video floating around the internet that he gave, but even more interested in lists. Is that right? Absolutely. In fact, I'll give you a very interesting story is that Gene Schwartz um, uh, boardroom and Rodale Press, which was the largest health publisher in the 80s and 90s selling health books. And and, and they and Rodale used all the great writers, too. They were with Gary Benzavenga and, and Paris and Eric Betwell and Arthur Johnson. So we used to get together. It would be boardroom, which would be Marty Edelston, the founder of boardroom and myself. Um, Rodale, which was Pat Capora, who ran Rodale Books, and Gene Schwartz. We get together in Marty's apartment and we would just like hang out and talk copy and talk marketing and talk art too. I mean, people don't, might not know this, but Gene Schwartz, in his if you go back and find his obituary, there's one paragraph of Gene Schwartz as a copywriter. There's the, the entire article is Gene Schwartz, art collector, dies. Uh, in his obituary, because he was a a, 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 a world-renowned art collector, modern art. He discovered artists and all of that. And that, to me, is also part of the genius of Gene Schwartz, which we should, we'll talk about in more detail. But I will say that um, Gene being a list person is, um, and this epitomizes it the, the best as I can, I can show you as, as far as, as, as opposed to just telling you that he's a list guy. So Gene would write a, a package for us for one of our books or one of our newsletters, and he wouldn't we wouldn't pay him any money. He, we would exchange with him seven hundred and fifty thousand names of the boardroom lists, which were the best list for health book buyers. And Rodale also did the same thing. 
they would give Gene 750,000 names for a package that he wrote for Rodale, which, and Rodale had also the best names for health books. Gene had a company called Instant Improvement, which was a book publishing company. He sold these little health books, The Tao of Sexology, and How to Rub Your Stomach Away, and really weird stuff, but interesting stuff. And Gene knew that if he had the right lists for those books, he would make so much more money than anything he could charge us for uh, a package. And because he would mail the 750,000 names, he would get buyers, the buyers would buy multiple books, and the, the compound interest, so to speak, of that investment of 750,000 names could be worth millions of dollars to him over the lifetime of, of his book operation. Whereas if we paid him $50,000 and a, and a royalty, it wouldn't come anywhere near that. So just the fact that Gene understood the power of lists and just by that he didn't, that's what he wanted as the legal tender for his packages. That says it all in a way. But he also, one of the other ways that Gene, I'd say, became one of my mentors. And I always say that, you know, you don't choose your mentors, your mentors choose you. And Gene chose me as a mentee because I did a lot of Gene's list work pro bono. And what I mean by that is that Gene knew that I was the list guy at Boardroom. I knew every health list on the market backwards and forwards. I used list brokers to help me, but I used to research the list myself. So I looked at Gene's list plan for instant improvement, of which Rodale and Boardroom were always on it. And I said, Gene, you're missing out on this list and that list. And the selection you have on this list is wrong. So I just did Gene's list plans for him pro bono. I just did it because he was Gene Schwartz and I loved him. And he was also doing stuff for Boardroom. We get together in these, the triumvirate, you know, of, uh, you know, between Rodale, Boardroom and Gene. So, you know, Gene was just a friend. And what that led to, and it, it's why I came up with the idea of, how you don't choose your mentors, your mentors choose you. Gene chose me because I did that for him without any expectation of money or return. And what I got was the best mentor that I ever could imagine. I mean, I used to go to Gene's house, his penthouse on Park Avenue for lunch. We used to sit there. The art was incredible and he would change the art every few months. So he had art and storage. So it was like going, it was, it was both an education in copywriting and marketing. And it was like going to the museum for a new exhibit every lunch I went huh. to. And it was wow. a phenomenal experience. And he just, he took me under his wing and not as a writer. I'm not a copywriter. You know that. That's why, you know, when I'm on the copywriters podcast with David Garfinkel, it's like, all right, what's wrong with this picture? I'm not really a soup to nuts promotion copywriter. I'm the director of sales prevention, as we, as we talked about before we hit the recording. On the other hand, I love writing. I love, I can identify good copy from bad. I understand headlines. I understand um, how to weave a story um, into my copy. And it's not the traditional selling copy, but, and what I learned from Gene is that, you know, copywriting run, it, it runs the gamut of, of everything. You know, it's not just writing sales copy to sell something. It is that, but it's so much more. And so, um, so Gene understand knowing he was a I mean Gene was was a list guy and he understood that he didn't know and he also knows what he does he also knew that going to an expert on lists was the way to get the information and I wanted him and it was a symbiotic relationship that I got the better end of that deal for sure but it was it was just a a marvelous relationship and it just shows you how much Gene understood lists, markets. I mean, you read Breakthrough Advertising, you know, he says that the copywriter doesn't create desire in the marketplace, but the desire is already in the marketplace. It's the copywriter's job to, you know, foster that desire once you know what it is. That's the list. That's the media, whatever it is. It could be, when I say list, it could be anything. It could be a mailing list in direct mail. It could be a Facebook audience. It could be Google AdWords. That is such a good point. I've never heard it put that way. And let's, let's try and make it tangible. So somebody's into parasailing and um, they want to be able to parasail better. So they join a Facebook group, book group called, let's give it a really good name, 
better parasailing. And there's a bunch of people like that. That that's a list of people who have a desire to parasail better. I hope I'm getting my terminology right here. So, I mean, um, that's what you're saying. I've never put those two ideas together before. I'm so glad you did, Brian. That's that's um, worth the price of admission times 100. I've always thought of lists in terms of, you know, the bad demographic list and the good response list and the good response list show people's interest. But it never occurred to me, no, they got in that list because they had a desire. Brilliant point. Right, um, right. And, 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 and also, you know, the, the, the importance in, in, you know, chapter three of my book, Over Deliver, is how paying postage made me a better marketer. And I don't, that's not to say that everybody should do direct mail all the time. What it says is that the discipline of direct mail extrapolated into today's marketplace in email and Facebook and every other uh, medium where we advertise today, um, the, the same discipline applies. And that discipline in direct mail, because you're paying postage and printing, that you have to make sure your lists are so dialed in with segmentation. So I'm taking what you said just a little bit further and saying it's not just people with a desire, but it could be the desire in the last three months. It could be desire in the last three months who bought something also previously on that list, and that makes them a multi-buyer. And then it comes down to RFM. And so RFM, which is the, you know, it's not a direct marketing rule of thumb. It's a way people behave in the marketplace. And so it's recency, frequency, monetary value. So a, a, someone who responds more recently is going to be more valuable. Someone who responds more frequently is going to be more valuable. Someone who spends more money in total is going to be more valuable. You put those three things together and that's how you do list segmentation. You can do it by hand. I mean, if you have a hundred name list or a 200 name list, you can do RFM analysis on it and you could mail your VIPs, the ones who have the most recent purchase, they purchase more than one time and they've spent the most money. Take the 100 people, find the 10 that have the highest RFM score and send them a Federal Express envelope with a free book and then and go and, and call them up as, and invite them to dinner almost as opposed to just mail them you know, indiscriminately. So the idea of segmenting by their behavior, by how they perform in the marketplace. And I always used to say that you know, demographics and psychographics are all fine. Um, but every time we did a model on our house list at Boardroom, so we had, we had a 9 million name database at Boardroom, 2 million active customers in, in, in some cases over the last 24 months, people who subscribed or bought a book in the last 24 months. That was our, like our 2 million name core file. And we used to like rank those 2 million names with, through a model that would basically all be based on RFM. We'd add psychographics and, and demographics to it, of course, that if they make a transaction, that's the most important thing that a buyer, a prospect, a suspect can do. Once they make a transaction, it can be mon monetary, it can be a transaction in engagement, but the transaction ends up taking them to a new level to that list being a subset of the bigger list. That's all I want to get across here. I want no, to get, that's, that's I want a to get really good reads. point. And, I, and a lot of people miss it. And I'm, I'm glad you made it. Um, hopefully they won't miss it now. Um, but what was the most important lesson you learned from Gene? Something around the world of copy. You know, everything, everything that I learned from Gene relates to copy, but not on, on the superficial level. So one thing I learned from Gene, he has a quote, it's on, it's on one of my slides, one of my presentations, but it's like, you know, you like basically you have to stay in touch with your audience. And as soon as you lose touch with your audience, you're, you're done, you're finished was the kind of the, the, the gist of that. And to that end, Gene epitomized what I call copywriting by walking around. And, and it's like what G Dan Kennedy talks about marketing by walking around. Peter Drucker talks about management by walking around, you know, you know, but you got to walk around. You got to be in the society, whatever the society is, whether it's your office environment, the environment that you're promoting to the environment in general, 
knowing how people are are behaving in the general marketplace and then specifically in the niche that you're writing in. And so Gene, you know, he read everything. Um, so you say, okay, that, that made him a good writer. Damn straight. And he, and he, and, and he would just, and his, the fact that his favorite publication was the National Enquirer tells you something about Gene. He's not a voyeur. He was just a student of people. He was a student and lists are people too, by the way. So when we say lists, we're talking about people. And so Gene knew that the most important thing was to understand people, how they behave. And if he was alive today, he would have a, a, a field day. And you, you mentioned like the, the power, the parasailing uh, uh, forum on Facebook, for instance, Gene would, would be a, would be like, he would skulk around the internet and hang out in these rooms where his audience was just to see how they were talking, the language that they use. That's what I learned. I learned that from Gene, you know, that you want to get, you can, you can say what, what you can use the words that you want to use and anticipate what your audience wants to hear, but no, you got to go fast. They'll tell you, they'll tell you. And so with the, with all being online, you can be in a forum with your, with your core customers, hear them talking online and you say, wow, he used a word or she used a word that I never would have thought to use. And then you use it in your copy. Same thing like, I mean, Gene would be all over Amazon reviews. He would go into, I, I know he would, he would go into like one star and five star reviews of all the books that he thought were being read by the audience he was writing to. Think about that. And then look at the reviews of these people, the one star and the five star, and just look at the language they use, the words. And he would like, knowing Gene, he would just take copious notes of all of those words and he would incorporate that into his copy because why use words that they don't know i mean you just accuse me legitimately of going over your listeners heads when i started getting in the weeds of regression modeling and all the stuff that we did at boardroom in terms of the statistical analysis of our lists but you got to get down to the level and it's not least common denominator either it's a it's a level that they can look i'm sure you use the hemingway app and i'm sure that you know, writing to a fifth grade level. No, I had an editor who grew up in Hell's Kitchen when I worked in Manhattan, and she told me if I didn't, if I made any mistakes, I'd be out in the street. So that was my Hemingway app, sort of built in. Yeah, okay, well, whatever it is. But, you know, I mean, Gary Halbert, you know, and by the way, Gary Halbert, one of the greatest copywriters of all time, he was a list guy. He, oh, yeah. I, I have tapes, I have recordings of Gary doing a three day seminar on lists, like how to buy lists. This is back in the day of direct mail. So how to go to the SRDS and buy lists, how to find a list broker who's adaptable to your marketplace, to your market. So Gary Halbert, copywriter, list guy. Well, the best copywriters are list people. They, they all are. Of course, of course, no, 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 no argument. So, um, you ended up republishing Gene's books. I'm going to show two of them. This is an old version. Maybe you remember it. Yeah, that's an old version. Right? And that one, we so only printed up. Uh, just so you know, that version, hold up the Breakthrough Advertising one first. That version, so it, Gene wrote the book in 1966. That version was the next publication of the book after that one went out of, this, the 66 version went out of print. And Marty and I printed that version up in, I think we, pr we we printed up 250 copies and then maybe another 250 copies. So there are probably only 500 of those in circulation of the one you just held up. And then we pub then we went on to publish a, a bottom line books version, boardroom bottom line books version. And then since then, I published the Titans marketing version because I, I, I had the rights at boardroom. I, I negotiated that with Gene, and then when Gene passed away, we, we just kept the rights. And then when I left boardroom, I did a new agreement with Gene's wife, Barbara, and that's the Titans Marketing Edition, for which I wrote it afterward. We put some swipes in the back of some of Gene's famous ads, and that's the version I sell now. But that version you held up, 
there's probably no more than 500 copies of circulation. Well, I, in that. Yeah, I, I have an original signed copy of, of uh, Reality and Advertising by Rosser Reeves, um, which I saw on another one like that on sale for $12,000. I may be a rare book collector without realizing it, but I want to talk about, about these books because you have well, hold up, the hold world. up the second one now, Brilliance Breakthrough. So Brilliance yeah. Breakthrough was even, was even more out of print. I mean, Brilliance Breakthrough, when I brought that back um, with Barbara, because it was out of print completely. In fact, there was one copy on eBay or Amazon that was $4,000 and it was a signed copy from Gene to Marty, and someone was selling it for four thousand dollars. So, in fact, when I when I wanted to republish it with with Barbara, I didn't have a copy of it. I would pay the four thousand, but I couldn't even. It, it was not available when I was, went for it. Barbara had one copy of her own in her house. Wow! She gave me that copy and said, "Brian, that's the only copy I have. You can't lose it." To, to get the book printed, I literally had to take that one copy from Barbara, photocopy it, send the photocopy version to my printer because I couldn't send them the original. And then that's how they developed the files to, to publish Break, Brilliance Breakthrough under Titan's marketing imprint. You have established that you've gone the length and the world of copywriting owes you a, a big debt of gratitude. But I just want to say how important these books are and um and that you have a, a special offer for for readers or for listeners who are readers of of copywriters podcast breakthrough copywriting i've been reading that book for 30 years brian and i keep through advertising and part of it breakthrough copywriting break, breakthrough advertising i'm sorry breakthrough advertising um and there are there, there been, are some there are some ripoffs that are breakthrough copywriting by gene schwartz oh it's not it. it's actually a very very unique and uh, powerful uh, book breakthrough copywriting it's my <laughs> book um but oh, yeah. um yeah it's not a ripoff at all but um no but there are yeah. ripoffs of pdfs of breakthrough advertising that oh oh called. sure yeah yeah there there are but um Breakthrough advertising, I've been reading for 30 years and I go through it with, with my clients, with my mentoring clients. There's so much depth to that book and so much practical value. And, you know, there are just little nuggets you can take out. Sometimes a book will have five or 10 good ideas. This one seems to have hundreds. Um, and the, the other book, you know, Brilliant Breakthrough, um, th that one is a workbook. It takes a lot of work. I've put some of my clients through it. One of them, it didn't take very well, but everyone else, it's just taken their writing to the next level. And it has for me. Um, and you have a special offer. Um, you give people a discount, all they have to do. But but it's so special, you're not even putting up a link for it. People no, have no. to send you an email to both books at a um, $35 discount for both of them. Um, at brian at briankurtz.net and put friend of david in the subject line and and then you'll work out the details with them and they can they can pay you and also if it's overseas or out, outside of the u.s um you're you're um, reducing the shipping expedited shipping by 50 percent. so right. um that's that's a really good book um I'm, I'm sure you've read it many times because you published it breakthrough advertising as paris Nimpropolis says is an advanced text. It's not the first book you read to become a copywriter, but it's mandatory reading to be a copywriter. Um, I am running right now through my business. We have these breakthrough advertising boot camps that we do, and they're like two and a half weeks, eight calls, and we go through the book with exercises because it's so dense, especially the first three chapters. In fact, when, when people get the book, there's a note on it from me that says, and this is from Par Paris taught me this. He says, you got to read the first three chapters five or six times before going on to the rest of the book. Because the first three chapters are so dense and so critical. And the, again, the book was written in 1966. It's 100% relevant to how people behave in the marketplace today. So it's, it it's such an amazing book. Now, Brilliance Breakthrough is more and, and you've done an amazing job um, because you have a you did a podcast um, 
talking about picture words and, and imagery that comes from copy and writing in pictures. And I did a, I did a blog post and I put a link to your, your podcast to everybody to listen to that podcast. And when they, when you publish this one, you should re give them the link to that particular podcast as well. If they haven't heard it, I think it's one of your most brilliant podcasts and you do brilliant podcasts all the time, except this one, of course, but you do, you do brilliant podcasts all the time. And so brilliance breakthrough is, and you said it's a workbook. There are exercises inside the book. And because I didn't want people to write in the book when I republished it, because I was taught to write in a book when I was four years old. Now I was an English major. So during college, I wrote in all my books, but I, I created a workbook with all the exercises and the workbook comes with the Brilliance Breakthrough. And that book is more like not just to be a copywriter, but to learn how to write and to write in images and pictures and choosing the right word. And in addition, Gene used to say grammar is overrated. And so not to, to write without attention to grammar, not to be sloppy, but just so you can be free with image writing and and writing, you know, in, out of your imagination with words that your audience is, are going to resonate with your audience. And that's what Brilliance Breakthrough is. So Brilliance Breakthrough, I have people buying it for their kids in high school, oh, yeah. in junior high school. Oh, yeah. And they and they they go through the workbook. And so, you know, it's master copywriter teaching people how to write, not necessarily to sell, but just to write, using the right word, choosing the right word every time. And so that's why they're very different books, um, both critical in any copywriter's library or marketer's library. Um, but Breakthrough Advertising is sort of like, you know, the, the book. Um, and the interesting thing is that when I brought it back, you know, as I said, 1960s, I have a copy of the original 1966 version. Um, and then we did that version that we published 500 copies of and didn't even sell it. We gave it away to most people. And then when I started publishing it with Barbara, um, we've sold, I think, close to 9,000 copies. And, wow. um, and, that, and, and that's at $125 a book. And we've, we've, um, uh, we've sold them in over 60 countries around the world. Wow. And Barbara can't believe it. Barbara's like, holy mackerel. Gene is like more popular today than he ever was. And, and when I get uh, emails, from 20 and 30 year old copywriters saying that they heard the legend of Gene Schwartz and that they could get a copy of Breakthrough Advertising and they used their last $125 to buy it. Um, I'm, you know, I mean, it's four or $500 on eBay. So my $125 is a reasonable price. Um, it, it's, it, it warms my heart. It's like being a shepherd of Gene Schwartz's work is something that I take very seriously. And my, you know, Barbara's really proud of what we've accomplished. Um, and I know Gene's smiling down on me every day. Yes, well, you, you've done a great thing for him and for Barbara and, and for copywriters. Nathan, you just popped up, what's going on? Uh, we are almost out of time. I did want to, before we're out of here, I just wanted to give Brian, a chance to remind the listeners if they do want to get a copy of these books, how do we go about doing that? It was like 10 minutes ago that you mentioned it. So I wanted to make sure we ended the episode with that as well. Yeah. So all they need to do is, is go send me an email, brian at briankurtz.net, B-R-I-A-N at briankurtz, B-R-I-A-N-K-U-R-T-Z dot net. In the subject line, write friend of David, and I will send them PayPal information as to how to pay for them. But uh, Breakthrough Advertising is $125. Brilliance Breakthrough is $195. I'm, I'm giving away both books for $300 on this offer, the Friend of David offer, $300 for both books and free shipping in the U.S. and half price expedited shipping internationally. That's the deal. Um, and if they don't want to buy those books, but they want to be part of my orbit, um, they can go to just briankurtz.net. They can opt in from, I, I say my list, but remember lists are people too. And so they can opt in to what I call my online family. I blog every Sunday uh, with, with stories, information, 
historical nuggets. I talk about Gene a lot. I talk about Gary Bensavenga. I talk about Clayton Makepeace. I talk about David Garfinkel. Um, and so, yes, of course, uh, okay. many times, especially on this Brilliance Breakthrough podcast that you did. And so, um, so folks should opt in uh, to my online family at briankurtz.net. And then I also, I have my book, and I'm not selling my book because my book, I don't make any money on. I got an advance for the book. I haven't made back my advance. So I'm basically telling you, if you buy my book over deliver, I make no money. However, what you get, if you buy over deliver at overdeliverbook.com, go to that site, overdeliverbook.com. Even if you don't want to buy the book, check out the site. It's got bonuses that are just so incredible. When you, when you write a book called over deliver, you got to over deliver on your bonuses. So I've got 19 keynote speeches that Jay Abraham gave. I have a Dan Kennedy swipe file. I have every Ben Savanga bullet that he wrote online in, a, in its one PDF. So you don't have to go scouring the internet to find them. I have a PDF of every Ben Savanga bullet. I've got two books, one by Dick Benson, one by Gordon Grossman, two of the direct mail geniuses of all time, both books out of print, full PDFs of both books on that site overdeliverbook.com. You go there and my book's decent. So it's not like you're buying a shitty book, but the bonuses are just incredible. The, bon the bonuses are great. And we've got all of all of that in the show notes, everything, all of Brian's like offers, email addresses. Up. Yeah, all done. All right. If you want to get links to all of these books, head on over to copywriterspodcast.com. Make sure that you like, subscribe, and favorite the show and your favorite podcast app. And until next time, we will catch you later. Thanks, Brian. Catch you later.